Los. Hi, everyone. Mike, Paul, Frederick, Rochelle. Good to see you all. Thanks for coming along. Uh, today I'm going to do a little bit of a reading, continuing on the section on kata uh, from the new book, The Budo Blueprint, not the... Um, not the uh, Budo Karate Masayama, but the Budo Blueprint, which is due out next year. Um, and I think I showed you the cover. Um, I think the cover is going to look really beautiful. Um, I'm looking for it again, but it never hurts to show you again. That's not... Turn over. It's not 100% it, but it's 99%. We've just kind of slightly changed the circle here, but that's the new cover of the, um, the Budo Karate book. Isn't it beautiful? And uh, you may have seen I'm playing a little bit of a game. There's my watch face. Can you see that? Hard to see, but anyway, that's... I've got that cover on my watch face now just for fun. Us Buddy, good to see you. Hey, Daniel, thanks for coming. Did you see the video I sent to the uh, Patreon family? Patreon, thank you again. Um, I sent a, a uh, message and a video out to everyone today, uh, all the Patreon family, so hopefully you got it. And uh, that's Daniel. See Daniel who joins us every session. Uh, he's my fall guy for most of that video, so... Um, Enjoy the video for the Patreon family. It was, yeah, thanks for your help too. It was Mike. It was good to see you, man. So I'm going to read a little bit, but I was just talking to uh, uh, one of the um, viewers, Frederick, and um, he's introduced some of the animal forms. And I just wanted to talk a little bit about that first. Um, I've got a, a whole section here in my um, planner. I've got this great planner. I love this planner. See this? And it's not a di diary planner. What it is, it's a, um, it's a planner for all my projects. And so I've got an alphabet thing here. See the alphabet, but each of those divides up into um, projects. So this is a project that I'm doing called Saw and Bread. And here is training and a whole bunch of things. But anyway, um, I've got a section in that. Uh, which I'll probably include in the Budo blueprint, but I haven't as yet. But I was just, you know, just um, talking to uh, Frederick just earlier on about introducing uh, animal forms and so on in the dojo for children and the value of it. I, I can't emphasize how really valuable there. I'm just going to put the timer on here so I don't lose track because I've got, got to go to training at 4.30. Um, now, if there's a really interesting thing, Dave, good to see you. Uh, there's a really interesting, um, almost contrarian way of thinking. The best thing you can do for kids for martial arts is get them to do anything except martial arts. I know that sounds funny, but if, if a if a child grows up focused exclusively on a single sport, you have all kinds of problems later on, not even bringing into account the boredom factor and the psychological factor of the expectation of them. But physiologically and neurologically, if they're constantly doing the same thing over and over, if something a little bit outside that uh, zone of, of action happens, they can really get caught and it can result in some pretty bad injuries you know and uh so i was talking to my good buddy mitch kachonda yesterday mitch is um, one of our patreon family he's also a, a uh, he was one of my uchi deshi and he was also a uh, good kyokushin uh tournament fighter and he's an athletic preparation coach uh very high level i would say if anyone wants to know anything about athletic preparation or needs someone to help him contact Mitch. He may even turn up here today. Oh, it's Patty. Good to see you, man. But Mitch really knows his stuff. And we were chatting yesterday about it. And he said that in his world, he, he's part of what's called King Sports International. Uh, Ian King, I've mentioned him numerous times. 
I quote him in my book, KSI, look it up on the internet, King Sports International. And they have a very similar way of thinking. And generally speaking, no matter what sport it is or what activity it is, if you can get children involved in um, soccer for the eye-foot coordination as opposed to eye-hand coordination, soccer, well, Marco, good to see you, man. Um, gymnastics because of the all-round um, strength conditioning that it, that it gives. Um, the martial arts in general, this is just not just for people doing martial arts, but to get into other sports, it's great for them to do the martial arts because it has such a, an incredible all-round effect on the neurology of the body. Uh, so soccer, martial arts, gymnastics. There was one more that I've forgotten. But anyway, the point is, Get kids to do something other than the sport they want to specialise in because it broadens, I call it, Mitch called it something else, I call it broad-based athletic adaptation, which isn't an original phrase. I read it in a book somewhere 30 years ago. And what it does is allows the body to adapt on a much broader base. And I know when I was a kid, oh, athletics, track and field, that was the fourth one. When I was a kid, I grew up a nipper for those non-Aussies a nipper is a junior lifesaver. Um, so they're little kids who grew up on the beach, and as they grow up, they become lifesavers, lifeguards. But during their childhood, they they what they call nippers. And the nippers is a really highly developed industry in Australia. It, it produces athletes who even go on and win Olympic gold medals and so on. And I was a nipper. I was a pretty good nipper too um, because I spent my whole life just running everywhere, track and field. I was a sprinter. I was a long jumper. I was a high jumper. Um, I could jump over my height, but I was so short it didn't really help in the competition anyway because all the other kids were already a foot taller than me. But the point was I was just – I loved doing all this. And a nipper, man, I was a nipper from the first ever nipper tournament. For you Aussies, this might be a little bit of history for you. I won the first – race of the first ever nipper tournament in the world it was 26th of february 1967 or 66 can't remember but anyway and i was in nippers all the way to high school um and and once you hit 12 or 13 you're not allowed to be a nipper anymore uh but then i got into karate you see so i gave that away but the point was all that nipper rugby playing rugby league um playing track and field running around all the time it just gives you this incredible broad base um adaptation Yeah, well, there you go. See, Lomachenko, um, Vasily Lomachenko, who's the greatest boxer alive these days. A lot of people are trying to nipping, nipping at his heels, but he's very good and got him to do classical dance. And one of my friends and, and uh, who trained with me, Yusuke Fuji, who became a, uh, an All Japan champion with the Kyokushin Khan, he was sent to Russia and he watched some of the uh, traditional dancing of Ukraine and places like that and it was so powerful and explosive and then he compared it to the Japanese oh whoop, oh and he thought no wonder they they kill in in sport because they have this amazing dance which requires them with incredible explosiveness and uh yeah there you go basketball and I'll tell you another thing about basketball Patty for those who see Patty Pinto from the Kyogushin Shuffle he was actually um a high-level professional a basketball player in his day. And so he knows a lot about uh, that sort of thing. And um, bas basketball, people who do a lot of basketball tend to grow. It, it tends to stimulate the bone tip growth when you, when you jump. But Salsa used to say that the number one physical attribute that transfers most powerfully to fighting was what he called jump ryoku or explosive jumping explosiveness because it transfers that ability to jump explosively transfers um, better than any other attribute to fighting and so if you can get your kids to do as many different sports as possible and don't even look at karate as something that is a fighting art treat karate and martial arts 
as another one of those four primary athletic adaptation activities. So you get them to go to karate and I get my kids to do what we call, you know, I, I spoke about it, the crucifix sparring, and it's just a game, boom, boom. It's just a little game. They don't even treat it like fighting. They're not even allowed to treat it like fighting because if they treat it like fighting, then the ego comes in and the competitiveness comes in and they lose sight of building the fundamentals that can come later on. Yeah, that sort of thing, the Cossack dancing and so on. Yusuke Fuji was watching these, um, not just, yeah, not just the Cossacks and so on, but all the different types of traditional dancing in all the former Russian states, Soviet states, you know, the Ukraine and uh, um, um, what is the Uzbekistan, places like that. They have these amazing um, uh, traditional dance that are very, very explosive, but that's what he was talking about, you know, and so... If you can do any of these sports that help cross-develop a broad-based adaptation for children, then later on as they get a little older, um, you know, after 12 years old, keep them going. Get them in karate. I reckon karate is great from five years old. We've got a little kid who's just turned six and he's amazing. But we don't, we don't even um, get him to uh, treat karate like a fighting art. We just get him to enjoy it, you know, and when he has a role, it's giggles. When he's rolling around wrestling, it's giggles, but his technique just gets better and better. So anyway, what I've done, Ust Rob, what I did, I was talking to Frederick about this and he introduced the animals, some of the animals in the dojo. The more you can do it, the better. And some traditional dojos go, we don't want to do that. You know, that wasn't done um, in the dojo. Solsai didn't do that. But you got to remember that, so also I spent an awful lot of time with flax plants and running through bushes and up and down hills and training in the mountain. You can be sure when he's training in the mountain that he did a, a really broad-based range of activities, you know. Um, <clears throat> even he talks about his Aiki Jiu-Jitsu instructor, um, uh, Yoshida Sensei. And he said Yoshida Sensei was the one that they modelled uh, – even even uh, Yoshikawa Eiji, who wrote the book about Musashi, and he read the book Musashi, there's that scene in it where he's sitting there and some of the brigands are watching him, thinking they're about to attack him and steal his money. And whilst he's eating his food, he just goes, and he takes the fly in the air with his chopstick. Well, he actually, uh, Yoshikawa Eiji, who wrote that book, got that from Saul Sai's uh, uh, Aiki Jiu-Jitsu teacher, Yoshida Sensei, and Sosai said that he was famous for actually being able to snatch a fly. He was the one who, not Musashi, he was the one who could snatch a fly with his chopsticks. You know, and so these guys would spend time doing that. Sosai hitting makiwara and blowing out candles and hitting pieces of paper, all these things create a, a broad range of physical adaptation, which helps later on. Good to see you. So what I've done is I've stretched. This is just a little thing. I haven't even put it in a book yet, and I think it'll probably go in um, uh, Budo Blueprint. But I've just got general training and objectives, and I've also got a note that says exceptions always. And there's differences in the starting age according to what I'm talking about here. But I've just got, I'm just saying respect the aging process. Because as I get older, I really need to respect the training process. I just went, um, I had a minor surgical operation a couple of days ago, and uh, I also got my blood um, tests done. And generally speaking, you know, 90% of it was fantastic. And in fact, is at the lower levels for someone much under monk, young, younger than my biological age. Um, and that just to me just tells you that if you just do a little bit every day, man, I don't train as hard. If I'm training as hard as I am at 60 as I was at 20, all that tells you is I wasn't training very hard at 20. That's a stupid concept to think that you're going to train as hard at 60 as you are at 20. The only way you can do that is be a softy at 20. At 20, 19, 20, well, I talk about it here. Let me go through this. So this is talking about um, adaptation for training at different ages. So pre-teens... You want to focus on flexibility 
and making training, the regular practice of training, a part of life. And the enjoyment factor and fun factor in the dojo is really, really important. Don't get them too seriously. It just puts them off. It's not fighting. You want to avoid the fear factor and the need. We talked about um, a game versus a mindset. A mindset is just enjoy and learn, enjoy and learn. If you get the A mindset where they're actually having to be competitive and compete too early, well then, I mean, look, there's exceptions to every rule, I know, but generally speaking, you want to get them to enjoy it so that they're enthused about continuing training their whole life. And you're talking about a broad-based athletic physical development. Uh, you develop the discipline and responsibility in children. That's one of the beautiful things about the dojo. And you create competition, but it's a fun sort of competition. So in the dojo, we'll do relay races and this sort of thing where kids are giggling as they go, but they're working themselves out. Okay, now early teens, I divide teens up into early and late teens. Early teens, you want to work all the somatics. So you start to develop their strength, their speed, their cardiovascular endurance, and their flexibility. Us, Rad, Sashiburi desu ne, Genki desu ka ne. I, um, send, I hope you got my message. I sent you a message at Patreon today. Good to see your name. Us. So early teens, you want to work on all the somatics. You want to work the multi-sport activity. So like I was just talking about. And Mitch Kachonda pointed out to me that the best four sports, and it makes sense, soccer for hand, I mean for eye-foot coordination as opposed to eye-hand coordination, track and field athletics, um, gymnastics and the martial arts in general even even if you uh get your kids to do different martial arts as well i can tell you now everything contributes uh and then in the dojo you know you want to get develop their mindset as well you want to teach them to be responsible as young kids develop the sense of filial piety, respect for the parents, respect for authority, respect for society. So they become a contributing, a contributing uh, member of their society, whether that society is 7.5 billion people in the world, 25 million in Australia, 550,000 in my city, or even 8,000 in my township, or even 25 or 30 people in the dojo. Each one of those is a community, and they need to be part of that in a responsible way. Um, in the dojo, accurate skill work. So they have to build a base. So you work the seven stages of kumite development. You work your, your fundamentals, kihon. And this is another thing that I really need um, people, I love people to understand, is when we talk about kihon, most people think the kihon are the 30 basics we do. Kihon is anything that works to develop your skill other than when you're actually putting your skill in application. So whether it's a self-defense thing or whether it's kumite or a competition, everything else you're doing is a form of kihon. Okay, so when Sosai says base everything on kihon, he means base everything on all those skills that you need to develop so that later on when you're fighting uh, comes around, it has to be on point. So you've got to develop um, accurate skills when they're young take the time to make sure that their their gaze their fundamental default position their stance is right elbows their hands everything they cut everything if they take the time as a preteen to develop skills rather than to be tough and so on they'll it'll just it'll slay later on um, Gary O'Neill when he was a young teenager he started training with me at 13 and he was so particular about technique. He trained with someone else when he was eight or nine and he got bored with it, but he also recognised that what that guy did for him uh, in terms of uh, highlighting the need for high quality technique never left him. So it carried through. Uh, also, early teens have to, you can develop a self-protection mindset. What's that? Well, especially young girls. I mean, it's a, a terrible indictment on society, but there are predators out there. And if, if kids do self, uh, martial arts for self-defense, it's probably a little too late. Difference between self-protection and self-defense is self-protection is everything that happens before the physical confrontation. That's when the self-defense comes in. And if you imagine that teaching a, a kid 
12, 13 years old how to defend themselves against an adult, it's just not going to happen. But what you can teach them is self-protection. You teach them the concepts. You, you look up uh, Nick Hughes's book, How to Be Your Own Bodyguard. Um, he has a website too. Look up Nick Hughes. But that book should be required reading for everybody, How to Be Your Own Bodyguard, and that gives you a whole range of self-protection concepts. And kids need to be taught how to do things, you know, the, the bully-busting stuff. Back off. They have to have the courage it's when someone's approaching them. Usually kids get caught up in public places because they're too timid to say to someone, actually, I don't know this guy. Now, back off. This man is not my father. I do not know this man. Back off. That sort of attitude, you know. So you teach them all these self-defense, uh, self-protection concepts, how to be aware, how to be confident about moving away from something so the fight doesn't actually happen, you know. Uh, and you teach them that the dojo is a trusted second home so that they're able to uh, feel safe at the dojo. And quite often you hear dojo instruct, and it's, i got no problem with it, who get a little bit annoyed because parents drop the kids off and treat it like a, uh, a nursery. Well, it's not a nursery, but the fact that they can t trust the dojo is a good thing. So the dojo has to be in the mindset of the children if if they have a problem getting home, then the dojo becomes their home. Okay, now late teens, you just increase the intensity. They become stronger, faster, fitter. They start to, um, and that isn't just late teens, late teens, early 20s, because you think about late teens. Matsui came third in the old Japan Championship. He came third at 17, fourth at 18, like eighth at 19. Um, you know, and he's just had this. So um, late teens, early 20s is kind of I, I um, include them. It's so, and you, late teens, early 20s, until you stop your tournament career. Some people stop their tournament career quite early, mid-20s, some late 20s, some early 30s, okay? But if you're fighting tournaments la later than that, it doesn't mean because you're 38 or 39, you now have to, wind back your training and train like a 40-year-old. If you're fighting tournaments and still there, you need to be fighting, training like a 20-year-old. Hate to say it, you just need to give yourself a little more rest. But if you, you, need, if you want to be competitive in an open tournament scenario, you need to be training like an open tournament fighter. So late teens, early 20s, until you stop tournaments, you, you develop the somatics in a stronger way. You increase your physical conditioning. Um, the number one rule is don't get injured because uh, I've mentioned in the past over the years there were fighters in Australia in my division who genuinely were threatening and they'd come to a tournament and they'd either pull out after one or two rounds or pull out before the tournament. And I go, what, what's going on? They go, oh, injuries, you know. And some of these guys would, I think, there's a couple that I have in mind, I think could be world-known names if they had a clearer training path. It's just that they knew nothing else other than to train too hard. So you have to avoid injury. Um, you, need to, you need to build a perfect technical base based on clear principles. You develop the mindset. You understand the principles, the flows. How do you set up that beautifully trained kick that you've got? Um, your footwork, everything. And you keep asking yourself those magic questions. What did I do well? What did I do wrong? What am I going to do about it? What would I do to beat me? They're the magic questions. And that's the constant friend of the late teens, early 20s tournament fighters until you retire. And I don't have one here, but your logbook becomes central to that. And the other thing too is the logbook, you can't treat it like a book to read. You know, when you get a book to read, you tend to care for it because it's an investment and you want to look after it. You know, some I have books going back like my Masayama books, I've some of them I bought in 73, 74, 1973, 74, and I've really cared for them. Um, but a logbook isn't like that. You want to treat a logbook like a cross between a sketchbook and a notepad and just abuse it, just fill it up with notes and sticky notes and little signs and arrows, and it has to be worn out. You've got to wear it out. That's what it's for. And then when it wears out, get another one. And then later on, you line them all up, you'll have some beauties there. Um, 
competition for late teens, early 20s, until you stop tournament fighting. You, I mean, if competition is your thing, it, you need to be really serious about it. I mean, this is what you think about all the great names of Kyokushin that you can think of during the tournament um, era, and they're famous because of their success in tournaments. Andy Hook, Matsui, Michael Thompson, Gary O'Neill, um, Wally, my student Wally Schnaubel, uh, Francisco Filio. You think of all the great names, and they're famous because they smashed the tournament training um, era through their late teens, early 20s, until they retired. So tournament, the, the competitiveness of tournament fighting can really develop some fantastic qualities as long as it's, it's tempered by the balance of being a good person, like Salsai said. Being a good fighter with, but, um, without being a good person is just brutality. But being a good person without being able to fight is just what he, he referred to as impotence. Okay. Uh, and then also during the late teens, early 20s, until you stop tournaments, that's a time of education, not just martial arts education, karate education, but your own education. So you develop financial wisdom. You develop and plan your future. And I say financial wisdom because we all know the old thing that if you'd save 10% of everything you'd ever made, you'd be a millionaire. And I know now that um, anything that stops, anything that limits my training is financially based. If I had, if money was no limit, Paddy Pinto, you asked these really good questions on your little survey the other day. And you asked, what you, would you do or what would you do? And my response was, if money was no limitation, if money was no problem, then I'd be off seeking the greatest, in my mind, the greatest teachers that I can find and I'd be at their feet training with them every day for a month or two months or three months or whatever. But we can't do that because we're financially uh, hindered somewhat. Okay, so for late teens, early 20s, tournament fighters need to learn to take responsibility for their financial future and learning financial. It, to me, it, it's a very important point. Learning financial uh, responsibility is, and financial wisdom is very, very important. Um, also, and continue and establish, uh, okay, so post-tournament 30s, maintain your body, no need to stop, you look after your body, establish strong habits of regular training because habits are vital. In fact, I made a note of that today for another one of my books. Let me look it up, see if I found it here. Here we go. This is a, mo a note I made. Habits that encourage and develop discipline and ownership have a powerful influence on my character. So that's an affirmation that I'm putting with one of the books later on. So these habits are so important, man. The way you clean your teeth, the way you sit down, the way you slouch, the way you drive, the way you eat, everything is a habit that is being formed at some stage. So the choice is you either form a good habit or a bad one. Post-tournament uh, thir 30s, increase your spiritual interest. Because what happens is there's always a void after tournaments. People go, well, what next? You know, especially kickboxing and things like that because they don't have the depth of karate. They don't have the kata and the history and the learning and the development that goes on and on and on through first, second, third, fourth, fifth down and so on. Without that spiritual element, there can be a degree of being lost. So... Uh, through, through the 30s and 40s after you retire from tournaments is a time when you, st you need to start to, um, you know, find your spiritual ground. Uh, kata mastery and competition. If you want to keep competing, well, then do it in kata. Okay, you can't keep con competing in full contact tournaments forever. Your body just gets broken. But you can compete in, in kata tournaments for another 10, 15, 20 years beyond tournaments. Okay. Um, so develop your kata mastery. Take it deeper and deeper. And a dojo, which is predominantly tournament fighters, is very different in the nature and makeup of its training content to a dojo that is predominantly post-tournament fighters. You know, you've got to find that kata depth and meaning. Multidiscipline. Okay, so by that I mean all five ranges. In the 20s and 30s, there's nothing if you're a tournament fighter, to focus on the tournament rules. 
So that means you can be stuck at range one and two. But after you retire from tournaments, you need to get multidiscipline. You need to approach all the reins. You cross train. You, you, you might train with boxing. Um, you go and grapple or you should already be grappling anyway. You take the grappling concepts into your carter training as well. So you need to be multidisciplined so you get skillful to it. Like also I said, you can't, no one has the right to call themselves a martial art and be ignorant of the fundamentals of other fighting arts. So what you do is you go around, you, you learn, you, you meet people. If you've had a successful, solid uh, history in Kokushin, you have nothing to be a, a, afraid of. You have everything to be proud of and you will be welcomed. I know that from history. I've walked into the dojos and gyms of Eric Paulson, of, of Jean LaBelle, of um, Dan, Danny Inosanto, of uh, Rico Ciparelli, Dan Henderson, Randy Couture, uh, all these guys, I've walked in there humble, amazed by these guys, but because of, I have had what you could probably describe as a, a fairly honest Kokushin history, they accept you. They understand that all, as Rico says, all forms are fluent and they would see the value in what you're doing too. So as you get older, you go out and you search and you open your eyes and you expand the five ranges so that you become skillful at all levels. Uh, you have to research. You, you research more and more and more and you find out things, you know, um, why we do certain things in a certain way. Uh, I, I did a translation of, I'm looking for it even as I taught, talk here, but I did a translation of Itosu Anko's Jukun, uh, it's called the 10 precepts. I'm looking for it. The 10 precepts of, uh, of Itosu Sensei. Where is it? Anyway, the point is that sort of research is just fantastic, fantastic stuff uh, to follow up. And, and karate has such depth. It can go on and on and on. Don't get it confused. There are people out there who start to do that research at 15 and uh, they never really strengthen the physical part. Kudo Mugen, Kudo Mugen, research, investing. Yeah, Kudo, good, Mugen, limitless. Yeah, research is limitless. Excellent, so true. Gee, I'm glad you come along, Mike. It makes me look good. <laughs> okay, and you consolidate my karate. So tournament fighter, 19, 20, 30, 35, retires. Now he has time to consolidate what he considers to be his karate. He has more time. He's earned the right to, to research and develop his own system. And we talk about my karate in, um, uh, in the seven stages of Kumite, and you develop your own karate, uh, you develop your own understanding and approach to bunkai. My bunkai is different to a student in the dojos. Everyone is different. Uh, and teaching in your own dojo. So that's a time, if you haven't already start teach, started to teach at your own dojo, that's a time where you develop your teaching skills, all right, because you have to give back. I was talking again to Mitch, and, I mean, I don't make any money out of my dojos. I'd love to, but every time I talk to someone about what I have to do to implement a way to make ten, twenty thousand dollars $20,000 a month, it just it, it blows my brain because there are so many compromises I'd have to make in terms of the quality that I want to achieve, you know. So my dojos will always be a hobby thing. It'll always be a service. It'll always be a... An, an, a, an activity of love and returning back to what karate has given me, you know. So you can start doing that in your 30s as well. And then in your 40s, once again, in, injury prevention and injury healing, you need to rest the injuries. Uh, you, you develop and understand and study and produce a healthy lifestyle. Uh, once again, that earlier spiritual searching, you develop an inner, a sense of inner peace. You have to be able to overcome. I was talking to Rochelle about this today. You have to develop the ability to overcome uh, the emotional uh, reaction to things. You don't want to let emotional charges blow your mind every time something little happens. You know, and the old saying, a saint who is sad is a sad, sad saint. If you're a 50, 60, 70-year-old man and you can't even contain yourself when a little old lady cuts you off on the, um, uh, on the freeway, or someone pushes in or bumps into you 
uh, down the street, well, then clearly you haven't learned much from your martial arts. So really a martial artist has to be um, someone who has achieved a high level of inner peace, and that's a great time to do it after you learn, after you finish tournaments. You know, where is it? I've got the, oh, it's upstairs in a piece of paper. I've got this beautiful quote from Shakespeare, you know, in peacetime you've got to be gentle and kind, but when it's time for war you've got to rage like a warrior, you know, but you've got to be able to do both. Um, kata, mastery and bunka, you take it even fur further. The best kata people should be in their 40s and 50s because they've had time to really think about it and go take it very, very deeply. Uh, you find a place in your life for regular martial arts training. If you're a martial artist, professional martial artist, well, then obviously it's, it's very dominant. But for someone who has a family, who has a career, uh, martial arts has to find its place. So you find what place the martial arts has. Um, you have to take into account family, work, you know, all those things, your physical, your mental, your spiritual, your educational, your social responsibilities, your family responsibilities, your vocational responsibilities, your financial responsibilities. Well, karate has to fit in there somewhere. So that's what you do. You, fl you find that. Um, still training strong but more rest. So in your 40s, I was training my butt off and I was trying to be competitive and I was pretty competitive until 52. And I think at 53, I um, had my knee in injury. But until then, I was still, you know, doing all the training with the tournament fighters and everything and trying to be as competitive as I could, could be. The only difference was I gave myself more rest than them. They would be training like that morning and be training like that three or four times a week and then gradually even less and then a really, really, really hard session maybe once a week, you know. And then a turnover I've got here in your 50s. I'm just going to read these through, otherwise I won't get around to reading anything in the book. And I hope this is useful, but this is the stuff that I'm looking at. In the 50s, you, you, you benefit. Then your body benefits from all the good training that you've done. You should have a healthy body and mind. You continue your kata in deep, deep research and you maintain flexibility. There's no reason why you can't still be super flexible at, in your 50s. And that de is determined by a whole history of flexibility building up to it. If it hasn't, if you haven't been flexible and you're 50 now, like the old saying, the best time to start is 20 years ago. The next best time is now. Okay. Um, posture. Constantly check your posture and kihon. This is really important. Oh, Sidian Caesar, excuse me. Whoa, my legs are going to sleep. But it's a very common thing as you get older, if you don't have anybody checking you, you go from nice, good, strong technique to gradually your legs will come up because your knees are sore, your hips are sore, and you start to look down and everything softens. And you're doing this. And you're a 50-year-old fifth dan and you think you're setting the example. So you need to make yourself accountable. And you do that by working with someone you trust and videoing yourself and honestly assessing yourself. And that's really important when you hit 50s, 60s, and 70s. Otherwise, your technique just gets really, really bad and you don't even know it. You think you're doing the right thing. I have guys all the time go, yeah, I train five days a week, six days a week, you know, and I'm really doing that. And you're watching me, oh, my God, are you serious? Because they've had no accountability they've had no one because they're the chief instructor at their dojo they've had nobody um keeping an eye on them so you, you take that carter and research deeply you, you really focus on flexibility because it's not as uh debilitating as cardiovascular training and strength training which are far more uh, exhausting posture check your posture all the time in training strength maintain your strength work that's really important for our elderly people. Uh, less kumite, more grappling. I say that because kumite is all about impact. And as you get older, your reaction time slows, you injure your fingers, you injure your ribs, someone will hit you in the rib, and it can, can put you out for a week, two weeks, a month. You, you get a thigh kick, uh, your knee's never the same again. Your body just doesn't recover. So you do less impact sparring. And more grappling. Why? Because grappling, you just be a lazy guy. Just go, yeah, just 
go lazy, lie on your side. And woman, well, if he taps you, well, if he gets the armbar, yeah, tap. You know, if he gets a choke on, just tap. There's no need to get injured. You just expand your karate in the areas that you weren't expanding when you were fighting tournaments and so on. The dojo, less hard training, pass that responsibility on to students. This is really important. I remember when I was a kid, there were two dojos in my town. Now there's 2,500. There are two dojos. One was a jiu-jitsu dojo, and jiu-jitsu was really strong and famous in the 50s and 60s. Then the instructors got old, and when they're in their 50s and 60s, they're a little older, a little fatter. And as a young kid, I walk in. I didn't, I didn't even connect to whether this person was highly trained, highly skillful. I just looked at him and said and thought I didn't want to be like that. Then I walked into Frank Everett's dojo. Frank was about 35 and he was a machine, you know, former undefeated um, boxing champion. Um, and he would literally in the dojo, he would get us to do push-ups and he would just look around and decide when to stop because no one could do as many as him. He was inspiring. He was just, and I looked at him and thought, dang, that's the sort of person I want to be like, you know? So, um, this is what happens in dojos when new students walk in. The older, student, the older instructors need to delegate responsibility to the young fit instructors so they set the example for the new students. Okay, and in the 60s, flexibility again, spiritually, take your spirituality more serious. By this time, you're retiring from work, you've got more time. You, you can increase the amount of meditation, increase the amount of turning to find inner peace. That's really important. A kata, you know, kata be, increases the amount of training. You know, in the early days, kata would represent 5 4 3% of your training. But later on in the 60s, it represents 35 40 45% of your training. You reshape your kihon regularly. So in other words, you become accountable. In your 60s, you, you have to check, constantly check and check and check to make sure that the old man syndrome of the, the round shoulders, the round back, the eyes going down, the round, the, the hand not pulling all the way back, you want to avoid that if you can. I always say, what's the best way to teach karate? By example, 100%. If you're not teaching by example, and and I admit, you know, I, I love it when I have Ben, Ben Ajamian. He's my uh, chief instructor at my dojo. And for all intents and purposes, I refer to it as his dojo. You know, and he's the young, inspiring, strong fighter. You know, um, if, if I can't do a technique by example, I get banned. But what I do lead by example, as Mike says, is I train regularly. I train pretty well every day. And I have this dojo here and guys come in um, most mornings, a couple of days a week. Um, and we train, we roll, we analyze stuff. Oh, and Patreon family. Thank you and everything. I'm setting um, 12 dates for the zoom to come up this month so we're going to get all those zoom sessions out of the way for patreon family which means we go on zoom and we have one-on-one -on -one. if you're the only one there great if there's a few people there doesn't matter we'll share the time and you have um, opportunity to ask questions clarify technique or clarify anything that you want to clarify but i'll be in touch with um my patreon family about that with the dates I just have to clarify one thing because I've got to go to Cairns for a two, a three day finally a meeting to finalize the book production. But once I sort that date out, I'll, I'll know the exact dates. Thanks, Mike. Yeah, Ben's a good guy. He's been with me since he was 15. He's 33. And I have to say that um, I have zero concern about putting full responsibility on him. If I had to do a seminar and I couldn't turn up for the seminar, I would say, Ben, you do the seminar, and I cross my heart and hope to die, people would not be disappointed. Um, yeah, he's, he's, he's fantastic. Yeah, good point. See, it's all about, like Mike Lorden says there, it's all about setting an example. Um, so in the 60s now, we continue on. You have to reshape your kihon regularly. So you have to have your kihon checked. And you have to, by reshape, not only check but also adjust it because there are certain things in kihon you won't be able to do at 60 and 65. And that's particularly the explosive kicks. 
because your hips and knees often are compromised. So you've got to reshape it. You've got to work out how you can do those techniques that are, um, uh, that take your age into account. Okay, and then also administrative administrative um, contribution. So in your 60s, if you can't train regularly, you think about all the great tournaments and everything, quite a lot of them are organised and assisted by older people who are giving back through administration, and that administration is really wonderful. I know people say, I don't want to do that, but the, the fact of the matter is we are training in karate today because somebody took time out of their life to offer administration and make Kyokushin available to us. So we owe it to the next generation to pass that baton on. Us, Chris Fox, good to see you. Raj, Us, Shihan, good to see you. Okay, full ranges. Expand into... unfamiliar territory there you go the full ranges other five ranges that is can't even read my own writing so you continue in your 60s to expand into unfam unfamiliar territory okay so if you've never grappled doesn't matter at 60 i'm in my 60s and i still grapple with the 17 18 25 year olds and i do my best um but the point is i'm learning every day so you expand into unfamiliar territory that's a really wonderful approach to take, okay? And you maintain your physical health and youth. So whereas in your 20s, it might have been 60 70% physical conditioning because you're fighting tournaments, in your 60s, you reduce that very carefully to avoid injury. And you train regularly uh, and consistently more than really, really hard. It's not those really explosive, big, hard sessions that make the difference. It's the con consistency that really counts and in your 70s and beyond them and, and for some they you know the dojo kun kun the last line of the dojo kun uh shogai no shugyo karate no mitsu suji means all our lives through the discipline training of karate in, in english all our lives through the discipline of karate, we will seek to fulfill the true me, the Kyokushin way. Nothing breaks my heart more than hear people say, yeah, I'm not training anymore. It's like, you know, it didn't really have anything to offer. I've had some great students. We had a young, great student training with us. And uh, he had one thing going for him, a really nice roundhouse kick. But he thought that that roundhouse kick was everything. And then the next thing you know, it's like, oh, I'm not training. Oh, yeah, no. You know, like it was... No one really was a challenge anymore. A, the reality is he just got, you know, a bit intimidated by it all. It's a lifelong pursuit and there's, you know, um, a real beauty in being able to maintain your training for 50, 60 years. You don't have to be a champion. That's the other thing. A lot of people get into their 50s, 40s, 50s and 60s and they start to feel threatened by the young fighters. If your young fighters aren't threatening you, you've done something wrong. If, you're, if you have young tournament fighters 30 years younger than you and they're not able to kick your butt, then you've done something wrong. The flip side of that is because you've done that, they give you love and they give you respect so they have no desire to kick your butt, okay? And if they do try and kick your butt, just drag them to the ground and loop choke them. And when they wake up in the corner of the dojo, then they can redevelop their respect again <laughs> in the 70s and beyond, okay? So it's regular exercise, flexibility, just gentle exercise, daily exercise, uh, teaching with humility and wisdom, all right? Have the humility and wisdom to know that you very well may be wrong. And then the, the new people who are coming through have been training for 20 or 30 years deserve a voice. So you, you need to teach with humility and wisdom. The spiritual side becomes really becomes central to everything. You know, you're at that age, your children are grown up. You don't have children to care for anymore. They've left home. Got a racetrack outside in the house. You know, um, they've grown up, and so you 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 have more and more time for your spiritual, your inner peace. And at the end of the day, um, if you're not asking those questions, where where am I come from? Where am I going? What am I here for? How do I go about it? What is the true meaning of what of life? Well, then they're the answers that you seek in your 50s, 60s, and 70s, and especially in your 70s, you have more and more time because there's nothing more. Um, humbling in terms of 
there's nothing makes me think more about whether I'm doing the right thing or not is seeing someone in their 60s or 70s who still don't even have control of their fundamental um, uh, desires. They still don't have control of their fundamental emotions. They still have no sense of inner peace and they're still constantly seeking outwards, you know. And to me, I kind of find that a little sad, you know. Um, anyway, you know, that's a real lesson for me every time I see someone at that age who still hasn't learned the fundamentals of life. Um, so at that age, you should be really going deep with your spiritual, uh, your posture and health, really. You know, you look at old people and what defines someone from a distance, whether they're old, when be beyond a range where you can see their wrinkles and everything, is their posture and their health. If their spinal flexibility and posture is gone, that's when they start to get old. So as you get older, maintain. I've got, got one of the guys who teaches in Perth, Nigel Garrett, his mum died uh, not too long ago, beautiful lady in her 90s, and she was a firehouse. She was unbelievable. She was energetic and moving and strong all the way until her 90s. You know, that's how it should be. Um, lead by gentle example. We've had Mike Lorden there and also Mike Clark say you lead by instruction. Well, as you get older, you think about Bobby Lowe. He led by gentle example. He was just the most beautiful man. You know, and he was Saulsai's right-hand man. And in his 70s, you know, he, he led by example. I mean, I, I'd turn up in Hawaii with work, and in the next morning he'd turn up, hey, Cameron, and we'd go and do some training. And his training was beautiful and gentle. And as a personality, he was a beautiful, gentle man. Well, that's the sort of paradigm that we need. Humility and love become central. You have to be humble. Uh, I mean, an old person who's not humble is just sad, man. Administration. You teach less, but you keep the dojo energy youthful and strong. Okay, so your presence is there and you contribute when you, you have something of value, but you don't try to lord over the dojo. You let the younger people run the dojo because your energy is different, but you provide a guiding um, energy to the dojo through your administrative um, uh, contributions. She don't care. In other words, as Master Jingle Bell used to say, give the insolent people an attitude adjustment. Yes. When in, when in doubt, Jean LaBelle used to say, when in doubt, choke them out. Just give them a little attitude adjustment with a smile on their face. And he was doing that in his 60s. Gentleman, I've grappled with him a number of times. And the guy could pretzel me. And everything he was doing was done with humour. He'd put something out. Oh, yeah. And it was, a, it was so painful. And he's giggling. He'd go, relax, my friend. If you don't relax, I might break your neck. I won't mean to. It'll just happen that way. Relax and enjoy, you know, and he giggles, you know, and that's Gene LaBelle. But every now and then you get some smart aleck who was 20, 30 years younger who think they'd put it on the old man and they'd wake up in the corner and wonder what happened. They'd wake up drooling or wetting their pants. And, I mean, he, he was capable of doing some pretty bad stuff. But he's a man. He's a perfect example of a man of love. I guarantee I could ring him up right now. And I go, oh, it's Uncle Gene. It's Cameron. He goes, Cameron, the wonder from down under. Are you in town? Are you coming to train? And I'd say, well, um, are you, will you be there? He says, I'll be there if you'll be there. You know, this is what, and this is Gene LaBelle. He is so humble that you could ring him up and, you know, he'd make you at home. Yeah, we won't talk about Gene LaBelle. <laughs> Mike, isn't this the real fight in Budo, not against the other? Yes, 100%. Not just in Budo too, Mike, I have to say, in life, everyone is looking for that something else, that something else. You know, there's a, there's a beautiful, well, I don't want to get, I don't want to sound, you know, proselytizing and religious because some people don't like the word God. They confuse the word God with something that happened in church when they were a kid because the guy in the pulpit really talked about God like hellfire and brimstone but didn't really understand the nature of God. You know, but there is this beautiful, and God is just, you know, all those wonderful inner peace, love qualities that we're looking for, okay? But that out of the way, there's this beautiful poem which goes, the child is busy with play, the youth is busy with his senses. And we can all relate to this. A child is busy with play, a youth is busy with his senses, the man is busy with worries, 
who thinks of God, yet he is the something else that all are seeking. Well, by God, you, you transfer that into, if you, if you don't like the word God, 100% fine, I'm okay with it, but you can transfer that into the, the sense of love, the inner peace, the equilibrated, centered state, our natural native state of inner peace and love. You know, well, that's what everyone's looking for. And you're right. This is what martial artists are looking for. You know, that you look at martial artists and the ones that really, really impress you aren't just, be, they don't just impress you because they have really good technique. You walk away you, uh, with, with a sense of humble uh, um, respect because they are something else. That as a human being, there's something else. You know, there are some great fighters out there. As a fighter, there's no doubt that Conor McGregor was a successful fighter. And I don't know him personally. I heard he's actually not a bad bloke. But when you watch the antics in the, in the fight press interviews and so on, well, you just hope for his sake that he's not really like that. I heard he's not. But, you know, some fighters, you look at Mike Tyson when he was fighting. Yeah, you, I mean, you really, you, you don't think you could have knocked him out? Yeah, in the first round I hit him and he wins like a little girl. So I just like to hear that win so much. I just kept hurting him for five rounds because all I wanted to hear him was whimper like a little baby girl and then I knocked him out. You know, well, even Mike Tyson looks at that now and goes, yeah, but that's not me. I've, I've grown up. I've matured. Tyson in his 50s now is actually a very articulate, interesting man. You know, well, if, if he wasn't, it, how sad would that be, you know, to think that someone is a fighter, but they, they hadn't even developed the most fundamental concepts of human nature, how to be humble, how to be kind, how to be considerate, how to be of service to other people. I've heard about that story as from what I remember, sketchy details is abusing some stunt performance, bad man, Jean Bell. Well, I've, I'll tell you more about it privately. I don't like to talk about it in public, but Jean told me the story, what actually happened. And, uh, you know, there's no real secret. But it was pretty definitive what happened. But anyway, so there, there are the, um, that's, you know, and there's a lot of overlap in those. You get very mature youngsters. I have a girl in my dojo, Nina. If you're watching, Nina, hi. Nina's 10, just gone on, just turned 11. And she's five foot 11 and has the mindset and attitude of a 14, 15, 16 year old. Her brother, Janos, he's, he turned up at the dojo at 14. He's probably 15 now and he'd be six foot two. So, you know, they already have these incredible physical attributes of someone much older than them. And the flip side too, is that you get elderly people who are quite youthful. So, um, you know, there's overlap in that, but that just, that just gives you a bit of an outline of um, the ages and the progression and how to respect your age. And I know when I grapple, look, I'm in my 60s and I have students 18, 20, 21, 22. Um, Joshy Campbell's in his early 30s. He's been training with me since he's a white belt and he's done a lot of travel around. Um, Guys who are 20, 30, 40 years younger than me, if they choke me out or if they finish me, I tap and I'm not at all disturbed. And, in fact, I'm very proud of them because they've clearly used good technique um, to deal with my experience. But the notion that I can I, – I heard, um, I think, a Salo Ribeiro, he's a famous BJJ coach, he talked about the first time he rolled with Elio Gracie and Elio Gracie was in his 90s and Salo um, Habero was a world champion, like a world champion, current world champion, grappling with someone in his 90s. And as they tapped gloves and said, and Elio said to him, you're really good, but I don't think you can beat me. And he's like, what do I do with a 90-year-old man who, who says that? He says, but then as the grapple progressed, he realized what he meant. And at the end of the fight, he said, I didn't say I could beat you. I said, I don't think you could beat me. So I'll often roll with students now. And when I roll with an early student or compete with an early student or someone who doesn't have much experience, it's really very easy. It's really very easy to tap someone out. I remember once I had this traditional Brazilian, 
if you don't mind, I'm just going to relax my legs a little bit. I'm sitting in Caesar and they're almost, well, they are, they're dead and asleep and I've got to get up and go to training soon. So I'm just going to relax them a little bit. Um, but it's really easy. I remember once we had a, a traditional jiu-jitsu guy turn up at the dojo, wanted to grapple. And he was a fifth dan in jiu-jitsu. And he figured that because he was a fifth dan in jiu-jitsu, he was senior to everybody. So he'd come along actually soliciting students. It's a funny story. But anyway, I rolled with him for maybe five minutes or so. And I, I, I tapped him out with a choke. I tapped him out with another choke. I tapped him out with a choke. I tapped him out with an arm bar. I tapped him out with side control pressure. I tapped him out six times. And then at the end of the roll, at the end of training, he walked up and gave me his business card. And I said, uh, is that your video? He says, yeah, um, I'm, I'm just, um, I'm getting ready to, uh, I'm seeking students and I'm, if, and I just, if you'd like me to do some private lessons with you, and I looked at him and said, I just tapped you out six times. You didn't have a single answer for what I was doing. What, what do you mean by I need to go to you for private lessons? Now, I would normally never speak to someone like that, but this guy was 20 years younger than me and had this really strange opinion of uh, inflated opinion of himself, you know. So um, if he did tap me out, I'd be going, wow, that's really good. You know, I have my own students and I have no problem with people tapping me out. I think it's fantastic. And usually what I'll do is someone will go, wow, that was really good. What was your setup to that? Well, Salo Ribeiro talked about when he grappled with a 90-year-old Elio Gracie and he realised he didn't mean that he could beat him. He just, when he said, I don't think he could beat me, it's like he went the whole role and he couldn't tap him out. Well, I'm really comfortable with my students. I'll, I'll roll with someone and if I can get the tap on someone who's, a similar grade, yeah, great, you know, but I don't expect to, if I'm a similar rank to someone 30 years younger than me, it's logical they're going to be able to sort me out. But my goal is simply not to necessarily get tapped too much. If I can't, maybe I can't get tapped at all, or if I do get tapped, make it hard for them to, to get the tap. Well, in, in a way, that's not a bad thing. In, in BJJ, they say that every 10 years, and every 10, uh, 10 kilograms or actually 20, 10 pounds is the equivalent of another rank. So if at 60 I'm fighting someone my weight who's um, 20, well, then, you know, they're the equivalent of four ranks higher than me. So anyway, that you've got to take all this stuff into account for your age. Um, that's the beauty of going on camp when you get to talk well, karate team. Yeah, exactly. I mean, you go to some of those camps, you get an opportunity just to, we used to go to the camps up at um, Mitsumine. You'd lie back in the bath, in a steamy hot bath. Eddie Rowe, one arm Eddie. If you're there, Eddie, g'day. Eddie was one of my students who trained with me and a good friend as well, not just a student. I, I don't like to say that because I learned as much from them as they learned from me. But he was the one who lost his arm in a car accident. And he went to the, we went to the winter, winter camp one year, I think just after the fifth world tournament or something like that. And they have a 22-kilometre um, run. You may have done it, Rudd. But anyway, um, and Japanese sometimes don't know how to handle disabilities. So say they saw Eddie with the one arm and he put a gear on to run the marathon. And they said, oh, are you going to do it? He said, well, yeah, why not? And I ran it too. There were like, you know, 122 guys. I came 10th. I was pretty happy with that. But Eddie came third. And they blew their brain. And, and we were taking a couple of photos later. Got a really good one with Midori there. And then he said, oh, so I'm going to go up to the bath. So he runs up the hill to the bath, jumps in the steam bath, and when he walks in, it's cold outside, so when the door opens, it's full of steam. And he goes and sits down in the bath, and he can hear someone moving in the other side of the bath. So he's not sure who it is, so he just waits, the steam lifts, and it's so side. And he looks up, and he, he stands up, and he looks down, he's naked, he puts his hands in front, sits back down again, and he didn't know what to do. But there he was in the bath with soul side, and he had a you know, oh, you good boy, you Australia, oh, good boy. You know, he has this, you know, there's soul side. You, well, those sort of opportunities are fantastic, like Okamoto Toru, great guy, Tsukamoto, yeah, fantastic. I don't know Shimamoto, Takuma Koketsu, yeah. You know, they're really, and they like, they like being away from the karate world too, and they like being with foreigners because they get out of that senpai kohai thing. You know, if you're sitting there talking to them, 
and someone walks in, they have to like, oh, shut up. They can't talk so much. So, yeah, they love it. And, um, you know, so they're the I, – I had a whole section of my book that I was going to do and I didn't even get around to it because we talked about that particular um, area of life, uh, of, of training, where you have to take into consideration the ages, you know. But let me just read two sections of the book. They're very, very short, so it won't take long. One is on CTE, which is chronic – traumatic encephalopathy and I, it's just one paragraph that I've written about it which I think is really important and I think I wrote it because uh, there was some stuff talking about it and I started to do some research I found some really interesting research and there's uh, an endogenous chemical again I was talking to uh, Rochelle about it there's an endogenous chemical or, or um, maybe chemical is not the right word it's an endogenous um, um, you'll tell me what it is, uh, Rochelle, called glutathione, which is a tripeptide, very interesting. And if the body could constantly produce an inexhaustible supply of, of glutathione, our body essentially wouldn't age and things like uh, brain trauma, would the body would virtually be able to um, beat itself. You know, when somebody overdoses on... Um, acetaminophen or Panadol, they take them to the hospital and want to put them on a drip of N-acetylcysteine. And cysteine is one of the three tripeptides that produces glutathione. And cysteine is the one that runs out. So if you could supply your body with an endless amount of cysteine, you could keep producing the um, glutathione. And and the, the IV drip of N-acetylcysteine doesn't, it can't stop the liver from um, but if you are able to supply the body with an endless source that, um, so that the, the body itself could produce sufficient um, glutathione, there are doctors that say that it's quite possible for the body to be able to equilibrate the uh, overdose of chemicals, that uh, the overdose reaction that kills the, um, the liver. And that's why people die from overdoses of Panadol. Okay, CT, let me just read this quickly. I'll just quickly check. Um, um, Bugger, we keep losing. Here we go. Okay, CT, chronic traumatic encephalop encephalopathy. It's really important in Kyokushin too and in any martial art. And, and by the way, again, I keep digressing. That's why Kyokushin is so beautiful because um, a lifetime in Kyokushin, you, you accumulate the same amount of head trauma that the average boxer or kickboxer might in a week of training because of we don't have the headshots. So whilst it's one of Kyokushin's drawbacks, you don't necessarily learn to read the headshots. It's also one of Kyokushin's strongest benefits that allows you to train for a lifetime is that avoiding that uh, head trauma. Chronic traumatic encephalopathy or CTE has been started, studied for about 100 years, originally, associated, originally in boxes. It was first known as dementia pugilistica, a neurological disorder associated with head trauma that led to dementia. The term CTE was first coined in 1949 and has become more widely known today as a result of the work of Dr. Bennett Omalu. You might have seen that movie Concussion. If you haven't, it's really worth seeing. The work of Dr. Bennett Omalu on the effects of head trauma amongst professional NFL players, NFL athletes. In the early days, it was strongly thought to be only associated with boxers, but we now know it can be found extensively, but not exclusively among athletes involved in any sport where deliberate or accidental blows to the head occur. And that includes Kyokushin. This is why I included it. That includes any contact sport, including high ice hockey, soccer, especially result of heading the ball, rugby, wrestling, boxing, MMA, kickboxing, and even Kyokushin karate. Any activity involved in repetitive head impact can lead to CTE. A real problem is that symptoms may not begin to show for many years, leading to some athletes still in training to believe that they are either immune to it or their sport is not dangerous as some believe. Okay. That's a little bit about where are we here? That's a little bit about that CTE. I think it's really important to uh, keep that in mind. Um, and uh, there's one little paragraph and I'll call it a day because it's getting on. 
Uh, besides, my, this is called Kata and Old Age, and it's in reference to what we just did where we're talking about the, the, uh, the type of training that needs to be addressed, taking age into consideration. Because mastering all the blocks and attacks in a kata, besides mastering all the blocks and attacks in a kata, you must also investigate techniques appropriate to your own age, build, height, and individual characteristics. One of the first things to go as the years advance is the high Im impact kumite that is a hallmark of Kyokushin dojo training. The spirit is willing, but the body just doesn't recover as quickly. So the experience of kumite becomes less frequent and less enjoyable. I mean, you can only go home so often after being bashed in kumite. Well, not even bashed. You can still hold your own, but the, the effort to hold your own in kumite against strong young fighters just accumulates injury and you, you just don't heal, you know, so it becomes less enjoyable. One common comment that many friends involved in numerous systems of fight training make is that after retiring from competition, what next? For lifelong followers of karate, that is where kata training can play a particularly important role. The danger is that along with the changes in the body as a result of the advancing years, without careful monitoring and a trusted friend or mentor, Technique can become sloppy, and that often can't be helped without making adjustments in training, adjustments in the mindset of the student, as well as in the technical requirements. One area that impacts significantly on quality performance of technique is loss of lower limb flexibility and mobility, usually a combined result of both injury and aging. So adjustments need to be made on, uh, to training to compensate so that the older student can continue to train successfully. <clears throat> Excuse me. From what I have seen, this is the way it goes. One, lower limb injuries open the door to degrees of loss of mobility in the legs. Two, loss of mobility impacts training, especially strength training. Three, less training combined with the natural aging process and the loss of mobility affect posture as the body compensates to deal with the discomfort. Four, compromised posture affects every aspect of movement. Techniques become shorter. Straight line motions become shorter and circular lines of motion become smaller. Five, technical de degeneration continues. What makes this particularly unfortunate is that often the karateka involved is a high rank, so it doesn't have a mentor or instructor senior enough to help guide them with overcoming the problem. And that's just that chapter on old age. And this is why it's really important as you get older to invite accountability by having someone video you, watch you, give you advice, tell you, someone trusted, like um, I'll be able to do it with Ben without a problem in the world. Ben is very humble and very um, loyal and he would never say anything uh, against me or my technique. But if I asked him to, 100%, he's spot on. He go, yeah, you're doing this, you're doing that, da, da, da. So that's what you need as you get older. There's only one rule in Kumite, the rule. Someone, if there is, if there, is there any rule in Kumite that rules someone out if they receive knockouts? There should be. And it happened that one Kokushin died in a, in a grading in Sydney. And... Uh, that, they were cleared. I think the people who uh, were supervising the dojo did everything they could and they did what with what they thought was right. But I think it was a lot to do with um, he copped one or two hits in the head perhaps and also dehydration. So we had uh, Dr. Gillian Farmer, I've mentioned to you her, which is my first female black belt, who's now the, uh, she's the head of the medical division of the United Nations. Uh, and having her in the dojo was fantastic because she had no problem in telling me straight if she thought something wasn't appropriate. And we used to do the gradings in the old day, uh, the old ways, and where we'd do a long grading, and, but we would give very, very limited um, water breaks. And she just said, no, it's got to change. So we introduced water breaks regularly, and it didn't affect it. Um, but as far as... Uh, as far as Kyokushin tournaments go, well, no, I think the only, Marco, I think the only uh, monitoring we has, have is if an instructor of a student knows that that student has been knocked out. Um, I think they do try and implement it. And the way we protect it is many states have um, a martial arts board. And if a fighter in any 
in any event that has the potential of knockout. If a fighter gets knocked out, well, then it has to be recorded and they can't compete again for 30 days. The unfortunate thing is um, because CTE uh, doesn't necessarily show uh, symptoms very early, a lot of those fighters will do what they can to circumvent those rules and they'll go back in and fight again and that can lead to problems later on. Um, I know in 1987, I was talking to another good buddy, Shannon, Shannon Friend, uh, trained with me back in the 80s, and he now lives uh, in New Jersey. His mother's got a, a coffee shop and toyed and 20 toyed down in New Jersey. Now, that's um, Shannon. Shannon's a great guy, and he actually uh, worked with the band Foreigner for many, many years, may still do it. But anyway, uh, we were talking about, uh, this, I attended a tournament. I fought in the Australia versus New Zealand tournament. And uh, my opponent then, really nice guy, but he was also a boxer. And he went whack and knocked me out, which, as you know, is against the rules. And all I remember was I got to get up because if I don't, I may not get selected for the Australian team. So I got up and, and I was very, very concussed. And I kept fighting. And I ended up knocking him out with a, a head kick and won by hip one. But uh, to his credit, the um, John Taylor, who was running the tournament, wouldn't let me then fight in the final. That was a semi-final. I wouldn't let me fight in the final. And I, he called my name up to get my second place trophy. And I remember reverting to like a 10-year-old kid. I was like, oh, did I win? And he goes, yeah, you won. So, oh, goody. You know, I walked up, oh, look, I got my trophy. But they put me in hospital for night and observed. And what they do is they put you in, they wake you up every hour and they ask, you know, who are you? What's your name? Where? How old are you? What happened? Why are you here? All this. And they just test, you know, your neurological reaction and so on to see how badly you're concussed. Well, that has to be monitored. Well, when fighters de deliberately circumvent the guidelines they have to help them, well, then there's, that's a disaster waiting to happen. And another big thing is dehydration. When fighters um, drop massive amounts of weight, one of the problems is the effect it has on the brain as well. Female motorcycle died from shocking injuries, cut weight. Yeah, no water. There you go. Cutting weight is is a terrible thing because it dehydrates the brain as well. Um, Rochelle, you may be able to tell us a squillion things more about that, and you haven't even made comment. Yep. That's they're very sad. Look, thank you guys. I'll leave it there. It's quarter past four. Hope you got something out of that. It was a little bit off track, but because I was talking to uh, um, um, Frederick. Frederick in um, Sweden about those animal forms. I just thought I'd read through those sections of what I think are very important for the different areas of life as you get older in training. You need to be here. I mean, I'm, I'm 60 now and I feel like I've still got 30 years of good training ahead of me. You need to be here. You don't want something. You don't want your dojo being run in a way that discourages people from training beyond 25 or 30. Of course, Francie, merci beaucoup, mon ami. Us, thank you. Very nice to start the day listening. Good on you, Sven. Thank you, man. That's great. Uh, Mike, yep, good on you. Thanks for coming. Daniel, thanks, Daniel. And all you Patreon family, check out the video on uh, dominant head position. That's Daniel right there. He's the main man. <laughs> good on you. Good on you, Rochelle. Thank you. Thank you, Mike Lorden, for coming. Appreciate it. Marco, Mike Clark. Us, domo, arigato, they must have. Frederick, us. Thank you, guys. I'll look forward to seeing you on Monday with another physical session. And what I really want to do is run through, again, some of those animal forms because they're not just for kids. Kids love them because um, it, it, it's fun to do and it also gives them broad-based development. But they're also good for adults, okay? So um, I'll run through some of those on Monday as well. Thanks, everyone. Appreciate your time. I always really appreciate it. If you're not... Subscribe, do so. Subscribe, hit the uh, notification bell, leave a message later on. I always try to get back to the messages eventually. Um, share the video. I don't have a marketing team. I'm a one-man band. But if you share the links and videos and tell your buddies and mates, um, I'm up to about 740 subscribers on YouTube. And let's. So I want to see if I can get to a million by the end of September. <laughs> it's going to take an awful lot of sharing. Us, Torbjörn. Thanks, guys. See you on Monday. Appreciate it very much.